carrying the tradition forward. Um, we're very much interested in Giacchetti's work from the past, but also how it works in the, in the present. We have Franco and Raymond in Florida and Serena and Slovenia and people in the state of Maryland and Portland, Maine and New York City and the UK. So welcome to new folks and welcome back to the others who have been with us before. I will turn it over to Cindy and Remy. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Cindy Case. I am a diploma fellow with the Chiquiti Council of America, as well as a soloist dancer with Valley Theater of Maryland. Hi, um, I'm Remy Young. I am a dancer with ABT. I trained at my home studio with Bridget Porter Young and Gay Porter, who some of you may know until I was 16, um, where I received up to intermediate in Chiquetti, and then went to JKO with Franco and Raymond, uh, where it was a perfect continuation of the Chiquetti training into the ABT curriculum. Absolutely. Um, we're really excited to be here today. And overall, what we'll be sharing is about our personal experiences as Chiquetti trained professionals the benefits that we've received as dancers from working within the method, as well as a few examples of the maestro's influence on choreography from the, the 19th, the 20th, all the way through the 21st century. Um, zero, zeroing in a little bit more on my training, I feel personally that I would not have a career right now if it hadn't been for the Chiquetti method. Um, I started a lot older than a lot of my peers. I was about 12 when I first started taking ballet. And it was that really systematic approach of the method, both technically as well as artistically, that I think was enabled me to catch up. Um, I came to uh, Pam Moore's school when I was 15 years old with an interest in just teaching dance and an interest in those teaching certifications. And uh, between the ages of 15 and 18, 18 powered all the way through my advanced exam as a student and it took exactly that long for Pam to also convince me well maybe you could also try being a professional dancer uh, so during that period of time from 18 to age 20 I completed my uh, teacher's exams from grade one through advanced before becoming a trainee at the Richmond Ballet and Remy, I don't know if you had this experience yourself, but for me, I had kind of developed this idea that, well, the Chiquetti work, it's kind of just one tiny corner of the dance world. I'm probably not going to encounter it very much once I get out and about into the world. But when I went to Richmond Ballet, one of the teachers on faculty there, Jasmine Grace, who's originally from South Africa, um, turned out to be a, a Chiquetti trained dancer through the ISTD, which I found out my first class I ever took with her when she started doing patterns from the intermediate and the advanced syllabus, just without explanation, threw them into class. Um, it took me personally about six months to fess up to her what my training background was once I got to know her better. Um, but in the meantime, it was very enjoyable to just pretend as if I was seeing these patterns for the first time. Remy, is that something that you might speak to? Because I feel that you, having grown up in the Chiquetti environment and then going through the JKO school, you had a pretty consistent training as you went through. Absolutely, yeah. Um, it. I felt right at home, I have to say, not only because of how Franca and Raymond welcomed me into the school, but also because of the similarities in the curriculums. Um, and then Diana Beyer, who is here, uh, when I was in level seven at JKO, she came to set Soiree Musicale on us and immediately realizing the, the similarities of the, the Shaketi connection that we had, um, I once again was just so comforted by that. And I think ultimately um, it having such a strong background and such a strong training, not only as a professional student, but now as a professional as well, um, it, it just gives you the confidence to trust yourself no matter the environment in which you're put. 
um, whether, you know, suddenly the director walks into the studio while you're rehearsing or on stage in front of thousands. Um, so ultimately, that's been what has uh, just really, yeah, given me the strength and confidence, I think, is, you know, it's obviously difficult work. <laughs> We're all very much aware of that, um, but for, for good reason, um, because it really gives you a solid foundation and a solid base, uh, something that you can rely on. So yeah, absolutely. It was, it was a beautiful transition from, especially as a teenager, you know, moving to New York and it's chaos sometimes having that, that one constant, um, was so comforting. So yes, I absolutely agree with that. Yeah. I feel that too, as far as the comforting factor of this is what the technique is. This is I want to say comfort zone, which sounds silly because it's such challenging work, but this is the discomfort that we're comfortable with. This is the base from which we work because my experience was a little more of jumping around from company to company and from one environment to another. So to have the background of the, not just the certifications themselves, but the years spent becoming comfortable in this home base of a technique really made transitioning from one director's vision to another's a lot easier on me. I think it felt simpler to know always who the dancer underneath was as you change maybe a couple aesthetic things from one place or another. Um, Absolutely. And I think that that could be applied on a on a micro level as well. Um, not only can it change from director to director, but choreographer to choreographer. Um, you have to be versatile to be a dancer. And so being given this, this strong foundation, as I mentioned, of the Shaketi training, it's like a blank slate for you to add on whatever you need to aesthetically. Yeah. I agree completely. Um, and one last note about my own connection to the method. I had a little bit of a prodigal son homecoming after having been eight years through my career. Um, the pandemic hit, of course, in March of 2020 and everything shut down. And I'm very grateful to Pam, who's on the call with us today because she offered me the opportunity to come home because by that point I was living in Maryland again and to just the simple fact of having studio space again, but it was during that process that we started to have the discussion of, well, there's just one more exam. Everything else had kind of come to a standstill in that moment. So I'm really grateful to Pam for pushing me to um, work through all of the diploma uh, syllabus over that summer and to complete my quarantine diploma with uh, Patty Sudo, who's here today, as well as Leslie Perico as my um, examiners. So it's, there's something to be said for having something to come back to. So many dancers these days are uh, kind of a American mutts when it comes to their technique and their training. And so there's not, they, they hear some things from one teacher and other things from another as far as the different positions, the different techniques that they use to do a step. And so going back to that idea that it's just so valuable to know this is the spot that we'll come back to. This is, there is a reason that things have been done in a certain way over and over again over the years. So that's something to me that's become very personally meaningful as well. Um, looking at just the benefits of Chiquetti training itself, Remy, is there anything that you would share just about the, the repetition and the strength building as part of your training? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, to get rather specific, I can, I can tell you certain steps on stage that I have reverted back to my Shaketi training. Um, for example, in Ramonsky's Nutcracker in the Sisters Dance, which is to the Merleton's music, um, there's a series of fuetes, uh, which goes fuete on de, on de your, fuete on de don, eight times in a row each adding a quarter turn every time. So changing your spot on stage multiple times in a row. And that is just such a difficult step that you really have to be on your leg, think proper, you know, front side in all the way around. Um, I think about Labaya Deridagio with the double pay, écarté, 
um, on stage uh, for however eight counts that feel never ending. And, um, you know, John Q, their flower girl, Adage, or Allegro is essentially just like a very long Shaketi on Shema um, on stage. So there, I mean, it's never ending. The list goes on and on. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's ubiquitous in these, especially classical ballets and neoclassical ballets. Um, I think I mentioned on the talk with uh, Franco and Raymond that like the genealogy of classical ballet really does create this um, beautiful family tree, I think is sort of how I envision it. Um, and the Shaketi method and the training has such a clear through line um, in this lineage. And so I think it's, you know, it, the, the presence has been maintained uh, throughout my career. And it's definitely something I'm grateful for, especially when it comes to those moments on stage when you really have to be on your leg. So, definitely. yeah. I, I agree wholeheartedly. It, and it's interesting having this foundation to build upon so that when you encounter choreography from certain romantic ballets, you see a certain step go by and you go, ah, I see. Whether it's like, now I understand why this step is in the method, or I know where, I know what the thought process was, what, what to already think about in my body. The famous example everyone always gives, gives is the Giselle, ballet, 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 that step that they do at the beginning of act one in Giselle. But there are so many just small step phrases that weave their way through the classical ballets and that you find um, sudden similarities with, or even just um, when you're doing corps de ballet work, exactly how you need to hold your body. A lot of the Chiquetti work, it's training you not just to dance straight up and down all the time, but to have those big body movements and to naturally use your eighth bulma as you're dancing. And I would argue too that that connects to that certain way, whether it's the willies in their first entrance, how they need to be just slightly projected forward, but still lifting up through their core. All of those little things are scattered throughout the method. Um, yeah, there's something that's so pure and wholesome about a Shaketi trained dancer. Um, and it's, it's clear to the eye, even the untrained eye, um, because it, it makes sense. It's movement that makes sense rather than just movement for the sake of movement. Right. And it's really very circular. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And even someone who's not trained in ballet, I think can recognize that on stage. Yeah. Definitely. It's the ability to not just move from one pose to the next, but to make movement through poses, that through line, that it's not going to be um, unnecessarily stiff or staccato. And I think that a really important part of that is the way that the Chiquetti work incorporates corps de bras in different parts of the class. Because of course, when we're standing at the bar, or a lot of the OMLU exercises when we first step out into center, so much of it is done with the arm on ba or just simply holding the arm in second where there's no extra port of bra, there's no extra fluff added on. And in the process of training a dancer, that's so important because it, instead of imitating the big port of bra movements that the teacher is doing in front of you, you are just holding your arm and that forces you to learn to dance from the beginning from your back, that everything is just fluidly aligned and placed. The subtlety of the apoma comes out from just the shoulders and the head rather than students when they try to imitate from too young an age and they start to do crazy things with their bodies and have habits that they have to unlearn later. So we start the class in such a pure, simple way but then as soon as we start to use the arms it becomes so intricate and so, becomes so complex it becomes such an emphasized portion of the work because we've already done all the effort already to prepare the body and prepare the back to make the arms work well which again it contributes to the fluidity of the movement because everything is emanating from the center of our body 
Absolutely. I always think of pirouettes from the second position. Mm. It is unfortunately a rare find in company glasses and whatnot these days. But it's always a great way to go back to any time I'm feeling like I'm in a rut or something when it comes to pirouettes. Going back to that or something my grandma would make me do is stand on one leg, déjà and plié to the back, and just stand there, arms on ba, and then turn from there. So it's these shaketti like exercises that you can always revert back to to make sure that you are that the movement is coming from the proper place and that you're using the correct muscles and whatnot. And to off of your point of the jumps, absolutely. I was just teaching a girl this morning and it's, they seem to jump with their arms and their upper body to try yes. to get the ballon. And it's not efficient in any way. I always think of what Franco says, small jumps, small arms, medium jumps, medium arms, large jumps, lar large arms. There's no reason to do, you know, glissade assemblée with your arms up here, like trying to pull yourself up into the air. Um, so yeah, no, it's just strengthening, period. You you can't argue against that. Definitely. And those, those instincts built over time, to go back to what we were talking about in performance, all of those little steps along the way as a dancer who's training at a high pre-professional level, as you climb that staircase, all of those instincts come to help you when you get on stage, when you have to do the crazy fuete series or the ponche um, in center without anyone else to assist you. All those different things, they become just an instinct of your strength and your coordination, as well as your musicality, because you have the strength and the coordination worked out so that you can start to play with the music and to do different and interesting things with it. So I think possibly, sorry, sorry, oh, no, no, I, I've just just a theory that it, uh, just came to mind, but I think that it's because some it's not something that you can necessarily see right off the bat is why it's, um, maybe taken more for granted, and especially with the younger students who don't understand what strength is required to pre perform a certain step. They only see the external, they only see the feet and the legs and everything, you know, schwacking up here, right? Um, so it's, it's different from what they see versus what they feel. So teaching a student how to feel something properly um, is what consists of a good teacher, right? Uh, which is what the Shaketi training does, so. Yeah, Absolutely. just a random thought, sorry. No, I agree. I, I think that it always comes back to that. It always comes back to the simplicity of the step and how you do it. Um, but as I just lost my thought in the middle of my sentence. <laughs> um, but the transition from being a professional dancer to simultaneously also starting to think as a teacher is a really interesting one. And I think is a, kind of a fringe benefit of being part of this method because there is that emphasis on also doing teaching exams. It helps you to understand the whole process from the inside out. When you are looking at, not that exams are the end all be all, but just as an example, when you're looking at taking an exam as a dancer, it is very from the outside in. It can sometimes be very external, but to turn around and to think about the same exact combinations as if you were teaching them to someone else, it does have to be from the inside of the body and working your way out from there. Um, is there any other benefits that we haven't talked about so far, Remy, that you wanna make sure that we bring up? I think we've covered most of it so far, and I'm sure it'll come up as we continue on. Um, I just had a major ballet nerd moment last night where I was searching through the ABT repertory archives. There's a website where it categorizes it either by year or by choreographer or by ballet or how, what have you. Um, and so I was just sort of going through, just because we are discussing the relevancy of Shaketi in today's professional companies, and so I was just sort of going through and I had the, you know, the Tudors and Ashtons in mind, but even connecting it to, you know, Balanchine and Rutmansky and just new choreography today, um, it was, it was really, really fascinating. But anyways, I'm going to back up a little bit and then we'll get there. Um, 
So yeah, there's the classic tutor of like, so I, as I mentioned, when I was in JKO level seven, soiree musicale with Diana Beyer. Um, and then that led into the company when I did Jardin Alula with uh, Vail Dance Festival. And then, you know, I would watch Stella Brer do Leaves Are Fading. That's like a dream role, right? So that's all very clearly, you know, there's a connection there. But then also continuing on to um, Ashton. So I started with the A's actually, I should have started with that. But so many Ashton works are performed by ABT Royal, so many companies. And I came across this paper by Richard Glaston, which I'm sure many of you have probably seen, but I just wanted to pull an excerpt from that because I thought it was just so articulate in the way that he made the connection. Um, but it says, many of the arm and leg movements in Les Rendezvous also echo that Saturday work, whilst terre a terre battery and nimble footwork of the pas de trois and the men's pas de six relate directly to Chiquetti's Friday battery on Chemas. In this respect, it is interesting to note Ashton's own reputed ability to do small battery. Part of one of those Friday beaten steps on diagonal was incorporated into the Fontaine solo and birthday offering. The virtuoso element characteristic of much of Schuchetti's Grand Allegro found its way into Colo's solos in La Female Garde. He also mentions that the Raw Merce movement to puncture a pirouette in symphonic, uh, symphonic variations the sideways bends in Laval, in La Valse, uh, the mercury attitude and monotones, which I will also add is frequently found in Macarva's Le Bider. Um, But yeah, it, it was just so fascinating to read about all of these ballets that are still being performed, that we're still rehearsing every single day. Um, but ultimately, back to sort of what we've been what we've been saying, it's just that, frankly, it's my opinion that you know, Shiketti training is just unquestionably the way to gain the strength required to perform these roles. Um, you know, like uh, Sylvia Lafitte and Cinderella, like what Ashton Ballet is not difficult, right? And so that's just what is required of it. Um, but that being said, I thought we could do a little like scavenger hunt moment. I found a one minute clip of monotones and symphonic variations um, from Royal's YouTube page. So if we could to share the screen really quickly. I thought it'd be great to sort of see it in action. As ballet moves forward through neoclassical and contemporary ballet and whatever we decide to call it next, postmodernist, um, as we move forward, there's this idea that each generation of choreographers is in some way trying to subvert or uh, dismiss, you know, to come up with something very distinctive and new and get further and further away from the beautiful work of the past. But looking at that video, those videos together, it really emphasizes that so many choreographers are looking to build from the base of that training, um, which so clearly in that case is the Chiquetti work. Absolutely, yeah, I mean, oh, okay, I need to transfer host back to you. Okay, I will do that in just a second. Um, I mean, even just from the Ranch on Lair, right? And Pirouette's Landing and Attitude, it's classic Chiquetti, right? And actually, I think that the boy in uh, Symphonic Variations on the right-hand side, James Hay, he was in the video that Diane Van Skewer made for the Shaketi Diploma work, which I'm sure you all have seen. It's just absolutely beautiful. I love studying that video. But um, apparently all of the dancers said that even though it was just so, so difficult and imagine how many times they had to do that to make that video also. But they recognized after doing that work, how once they got back into the rehearsal studios, just working on their normal repertoire, how grateful they were because it felt easy after doing all that work. So. I mean, that's a perfect testament right there. Mm -hmm. But yes, here, and Barbara, I will transfer the host back to you. I had a funny experience similar to that, although on a younger, less experienced scale, while I was a trainee at Richmond Ballet still, the uh, summer intensive for Chiquetti USA was hosted in their studios one year. And they offered the opportunity for the trainees and the students in their school to uh, be given a scholarship to this one week program. And I reached out to the director of our school, Judy Jacob, to let her know, oh, this is actually my training. 
I would be thrilled to get an opportunity to work this way. But the week of the program, it was really fascinating to see the Chiquetti work that we were doing through the eyes of the students from the Richmond Valley School. It was their first exposure to it, as far as they knew. Of course, as I mentioned, Jasmine Grace, she was one of their teachers, but it was really fascinating to see them encounter um, some of these more challenging movements for the first time. And similarly, once they went back to normal classes, they seemed to feel better for it, even just the comparison of the difficulty level. So it definitely is a big change from a lot of the company classes and the pre-professional classes that we take today. So often, especially in a company setting where you are trying to get warmed up for your day and your mind might already be on the next rehearsal that you have, I feel that sometimes company classes end up being kind of breezy. The teacher at the front of the room is trying to give a really positive experience. And so you're kind of moving through and doing things, but not always in the most systematic way. And so having those patterns to come back to and work on your own can end up being really beneficial to you as a dancer. Absolutely, yeah. It's, it's kind of a shame because um, I find that sometimes the more difficult teachers, we have two options for company classes. And unfortunately, some of the more difficult teachers do not get as many students in their classes uh, because sometimes the dancers at the end of the week just end up wanting a simple, straightforward, easy, breezy class. And so then obviously teachers want dancers to come to their classes. So then they'll make the classes easier or try to go easier on the, whatever they may be doing. Um, just to appeal to more, more people. But then when you wanna be challenged because maybe your rehearsal day is not as strenuous or whoever just needs more, being able to come back to this and especially in quarantine, like I really admire the work that you did, Cindy, um, to get your diploma in quarantine, but it, it just keeps you going. Um, and it's just constantly something to work on and to, yeah, to revert back to your training like that, I think it's just so beneficial. Um, in terms of performances, so that's, you know, in classroom from day to day rehearsals, but in terms of performances, the one last connection that I wanted to make was uh, with Ramonsky's work, right, because he is our artist in residence at ABT, so we work with him the majority of the time. Um, he has this recognizable, unique dynamic and quick footwork, right, which is very appropriate for the Shaketi dancer. Um, and he expects the dancer to be able to transfer the weight very often and very quickly and without fuss. That's his biggest thing. And so once again, that's just perfect for a Shikadi Dream dancer because we're taught to, you know, land a pirouette on one leg or a step and then on from one leg do a turn or whatever it may be. Um, but I think the best example of this was with his reconstruction of Petipa's original Sleeping Beauty, as per the notations uh, that he discovered at Harvard University. Um, and, you know, Shikadi's quintessential role, Bluebird, as well as Carabas, um, the Aurora Rosadagio, the Port de Bras section in the middle of it, uh, just the usage of the that pure, clean Port de Bras that we've been discussing. Um, that was all present, but also 45 degree legs, right? So you would see a photo of Aurora. Her leg is just barely, so as she does that turn in Rosadagio with the men, um, on turn on to double pay, it's like a perfect 90 degrees in a fosse turned out um, with a proper port de bras instead of, you know, this Sylvie Guillaume-esque schwack to the ear. Um, so it was, I think, maybe jarring for some people to see. Um, because they just weren't expecting it to be more subtle and reserved. But I think it really paid off because it was a really, really beautiful performance. The, the Chenets were on demi point with the spot facing front. We had these crazy wigs. Everybody wore a wig, more wigs in that show than any other performance we've ever put, put on. Um, no, no tutus. They were all almost knee length tutus. Um, so it was really fascinating. It was sort of like a time warp to be a part of that. Um, but yeah, it's, it's still in our repertoire today and probably will continue to be as long as Alexi is artist in residence with us. He's 
you know, one of the best choreographers in the world right now. So the fact that he is recognizing how important this history is and making sure that it is continued on, I think is a really beautiful thing. Absolutely. The instant that we forget our past, as well as the moment we stop pushing forward into the future, we're not really anywhere because there's no sense of continuity with the past or the future. And so he seems like someone who really represents that ideal, which is wonderful to see. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Um, we do want to um, open it up to any questions that anyone has as we are working our way through everything we wanted to share today. If anyone has thoughts or questions that they would like to uh, speak up about. And of course, Remy and I could just keep talking about this all day, which is also an option. Sure. I have a, I have a um, uh, sort of an observation following Remy's uh, uh, talk about Ramansky. We were at the premiere in New York when uh, of the Sleeping Beauty, and afterwards uh, I saw Alexi in the in, in the front of the theater. I said, Alexi, there's so many set chakedi exercises in this in your version. And he said, well, who was the ballet master for Petty for, for Petit Bach? Chiquetti was the ba ballet master on Segon. So of course there would be a lot of big influence on him. So it, it was it's really amazing what he has done and the respect that he has shown for the tradition. It's wonderful. Absolutely. <laughs> I love that comment. I'm sure he really enjoyed it as well. I mean, Sleeping Beauty is not his only reconstruction, right? I think Golden Cockerel was also, Whipped Cream, I think, was actually a reconstruction of something as well. Mm. It was a German ballet or something like that. Maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm mistaken, but I mean, Swan Lake, La Bayadere, he's done many all over the world. And, and Harlequinade. Harlequinade. Yeah, of course, Harlequinade, how could I forget? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But because both of you, you was talking about the Port de Bras, Patrouille de Barra, and uh, this is something, and not only in Shekedi, but also the Russian, the way to close the arm and legs together, because it's an incredible coordination you need in the center. Absolutely. And uh, also, because like in the French school, I grew up with the French school before I learned Sheketi, all the reverse for the bra. Mm -hmm. And Sheketi and the Russian do, you reverse the legs, but the arms still going on the other. Yeah. And this is something incredibly important for the use of the upper body. That's an excellent point too, because I think something that's really easy, um, when, when you first join a company, you're sort of just thrown into the deep end, right? I, after all of this training and all of this intimate focus on you, it's just all of a sudden you're on your own. Right. And whatever, whatever yeah. is going on in your body and your day. Exactly, right? exactly. And even just taking company classes you were talking about, Cindy, it's, it's really easy to develop some weird bad habits that you don't really notice that you're doing. And so I think something for me personally um, is that it, any injury I've ever had, so this past fall season, unfortunately I missed out on the fall season because I had a stress fracture. And it was devastating because it felt like the worst timing after two years off and then coming back. It, the, it was sort of the culmination of the company being back together, back on stage in our, we had bubbles throughout the, the pandemic, but we were finally all back together for 2021 20, fall season. And so I just felt like, you know, my heart was being ripped out, like seeing them on stage and in rehearsals and not being there, of course. But anytime I'm injured, I try to take advantage of the time to just sort of recalibrate my system, right? Reset. And so I was fortunate enough to be able to work with a few different teachers privately, um, as well as my good friend, who's a principal in the company, who was also a student at JKO. And that was exactly one of the things that I realized I was getting into a bad habit of doing was closing my legs and then closing the arms because it feels good sometimes to do these things. Or it's like when you pour raw to the side, it's like easy to sort of stretch your neck out and turn to the side and do all of these sort of affected things. But if you work that way in class, then you lose the power of it. So I recognized that I was delaying my arms and I wasn't using them uh, the timing of my arms was not 
not quite proper. And so since I've started doing that again, I've just felt so much more power in my body, more centered, my, my centered line is just, it's more present and I feel just more on my leg, I guess. But yeah, so that's an absolutely, yeah, that's a good point. I think um, we need to, both of you need to discuss a bit about this thing called contemporary ballet. Mm -hmm. And let's look at Eric Hawkins and Merce Cunningham, especially Merce Cunningham, which I'm sure Diana would know that he studied with Margaret Kresk. And yes, most of his dancers did as well. Yeah. And I find it so humorous that we talk about contemporary ballet mm -hmm. when I find so many contractions and releases, over curves, under curves, moving balances in the Sacchetti work. Mm -hmm. That's Absolutely. all there. And so how do you, have you applied this technique to the more contemporary, the mon well, look at monotones. When was that done? Um, is there anything more modern than the right of spring? Yeah. <laughs> like Pina Bausch. <laughs> yes, he did. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you think about it. I have a hard time comprehending this thing of contemporary ballet. Mm -hmm. To me, it is all ballet. How do you feel? That was something that struck me in the Richard Gladstone paper, actually. He emphasizes how the Chiquetti trained dancers are so comfortable with doing not just the arm movement of a port de bras, but the large, the fullness of the bending that they're able to do to the side and the front. And thinking of some of the things, especially the ladies on point are called upon to do on releve in the major syllabus, whether, you know, from arabesque or ron verse into an extension and hold, all of these things that require, I feel like it's so, it seems so silly to be saying this back to you, Pam, because you said it to me first, but the use of a contraction, the use of the side of the body, those, Absolutely, they're all already there. Oftentimes the thing that makes it contemporary ballet does seem to be kind of the icing that you put on top of the cake. Remy, what would you say? Yeah, I absolutely agree. I understand the term contemporary ballet does not exactly make sense when it's all just ballet, absolutely. It's just a, a new piece of choreography, right? To add to the ballet repertoire. Um, I think what I find to be a common theme is it, everything's all very off balance. You think of like foresight and this type of work, everything is really trying to move a lot and get off your leg. But in order to get off your leg, you have to know how to be on your leg too. So it, it just having the having such control over your body is what a lot of these new choreographers seem to require from the dancer and in order to have control of your body you have to have a good foundation so it's it yeah it all adds up and it all goes together absolutely um yeah yeah I I think my my biggest frustration sometimes is people are trying so hard to make something new um without respect or reverence for this beautiful history and rich history that we have um so sometimes you know, once again, to make something just to make something like movement just for the sake of movement rather than having an intention. It's not even saying that it has to have a story. I mean, there are many wonderful Balanchine ballets that don't necessarily have a story, but it's still beautiful movement, right? So that's sort of trying to find the balance between like, where's the intention? Like, is there a point to this or am I just doing it because it seems to look cool and it's different, whatever, you know, different it is. Like, it doesn't all have to be different. Like, yeah, we can still go back to our roots and there's nothing wrong with that. So yeah, new choreography is definitely, it's probably challenging to be a choreographer in this day and age. I have no desire to do that, but you know, you do what you're told as a dancer, right? So it is what it is, but yeah, that's just my take. And it, it, it does seem to be an example of consciously knowing as a choreographer, which 
I, I concur with your sentiment, Remy. Um, but as a choreographer, it seems that you need to have a conscious awareness of who and what your influences are. And if you're not able to concretely state from what tradition you're stemming from, from what tradition you're drawing from, it does start to feel the flavor of the week. This is the current trend or style, which then becomes just as cookie cutter as yet another, uh, you know, neoclassical ballet that doesn't add anything new or yet another ballet choreographed in a purely romantic style that doesn't really know what it's commenting on or where it comes from. And I think that so-called contemporary dance choreographers, contemporary ballet choreographers need to have that strong awareness as well. Um, I just wanted to say one thing that uh, Merce didn't study with Ms. Krask, with Margaret Krask, but all of his dancers did. Paul Taylor studied with Margaret Krask for a long time. And probably you know that um, Ashton and Tudor were pupils of Margaret Krask's as well. So that's why you see so much Giacchetti work in their choreography. Of course, yes. Richard Glasson mentions in that paper. We can share the link. I mean, I'm sure most of you have read it, but I'll, I'll go ahead and share the link in the chat if you're curious to read it. Barbara, is actually, actually, we found out that Martha Graham had studied with Mar with Margaret Krask, a private lessons. Mm. This is what Eureka told us that Martha Graham would hide, not tell anybody, and she would take private classes with Margaret Krask. I, I can't imagine that that's true, but I, I don't know. That's what she yeah. said. Um, that, that was um, the one company, none of the Graham dancers ever studied with Miss Krask. Um, but I know Agnes DeMille was very close to Martha Graham and Agnes DeMille was very close to Margaret Krask. So maybe it did happen, but you know, way, way before my time for sure. I'll check and see. It's interesting that if she did, it's very interesting. <laughs> But going back to Pam, when she was talking about the contemporary, we was in Florence huh? and in the morning class, we was working on Conversion de Dents and uh, the grand company was performing and some of the dancers came into class huh? and I never, I think Raymond and I, we never see Conversion de Dents did so beautifully than from the grand dancer. It was spectacular. The, the line of the ending, the use of the upper body was pretty special. <coughs> Contemporary dance. And uh, this position in Cecchetti, uh, Bejar used it a lot. A lot. Mm -hmm. He used uh, the girl uh, with this position in second and du bourré. It was very strange how he used this position. It, it was funny because when I was by the master in, in Boston, we were doing at the same time uh, rubies from uh, Balanchine and also uh, in the middle, somewhat elevated by uh, Forsyth. And then I was responsible for the pas de deux in both, you know, the pas de deux in rubies and the pas de deux. And, and all of a sudden we realized it just came, oh my God, Forsyth totally plagiarized Balanchine, but he. <laughs> he changed it and musically changed it and the feeling was there but basically the structure was the same it was amazing how he was so influenced and I'm sure all the all the great choreographers who really go and study it back they always they're influenced by that tradition and of course Chiquetti was such a linchpin in that tradition. Too many people don't pay attention and respect to tradition anymore. Mm -hmm. This is a huge problem. I agree. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if they're still doing it, but when I was in JKO and Studio Company, they did have dance history classes offered to us. I'm not sure if it's still present in the school and in how many schools is that a course that's offered? I would, I would be curious to know, but I think it's extremely valuable and uh, should probably push for that a bit more. 
I know a lot of universities offer it as a one semester course for advanced programs, but it's so meaningful when students have the opportunity to do it, you know, not just once they're of college age, but up through their training, especially for the ones who aren't pursuing a degree in dance and are going straight out into a traineeship or a second company. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Yep. <laughs> now I just have got an interesting story which you might be interested in. Um, uh, it was a Jakesi day about three or four years ago. Monica Mason was um, on a panel discussing Jaketi and various aspects of it all. And uh, at the time, the Royal Ballet Company was rehearsing with uh, Twyla Tharp. And um, Apparently, uh, Twyla Tharp sat there. She was going to think about who she was going to put where and all the rest of it. And she said to Monica, um, I can tell the Chiquetti train dancers, you know. And Monica couldn't believe it. She said, what do you mean? Who are they then, you see? So she goes, this one, that one, this one. She could see them around the room. So Monica asked, she said, well, how do you know? So she said, they have a particular coordination. And I thought to myself, that's it, you know. Ever since then, I've sort of thought, now, what is it that we've got different different to the basics. And a lot of it is what you actually said. Um, one of the things you said, which I was so heartened to hear, and it's so good to know it's going forward in the future, that dancing comes from inside out. You're so often you see this arms held instead of the power, as you said, from the back. And then you were saying that, that it's not necessarily seen. No, it's subtle. And this is the whole thing, because it's logical, it's subtle. So ever since I heard that, I sort of thought, right, you're going to now really look and see what we have. Because when you when you do it from a child, you don't necessarily know what, what other people are seeing. It's like learning a new language. So I sort of thought, I'm going to try and see it from the outside in and see what it is that we have that's different. And I think it's that logical coordination of small arms, small jump, bigger jump bigger arms and the weight of the arms to get you into the air it's all very logical mm -hmm. so i'm just so heartened that you two believe in it so strongly because it means this, we've got a we've got a hope of taking it forward it's all very well us oldies keeping on going on about it but we need you people to go on with it <laughs> so thank you for sharing so much it's been great <laughs> um, it's got well I wanted to say that Twyla did study with Margaret Krask, not for uh -huh. a very long time, but she, she was in classes with Margaret Krask. And, you know, Raymond, I think you are right about Ms. Krask working with um, Martha Graham, because I think at Jacob's Pillow, Ms. Krask used to give a lot of private classes to the companies that came in, and I bet that's where it happened. So I bet you're right about that. Just, you know, I never heard it. But it's really interesting. You know, M M Margaret, uh, uh, um, Martha Graham was in uh, Massine's Rite of Spring. She was a chosen one in his Rite of Spring. So she also has that balletic background. And of course, uh, in, in those days, Chiquetti reigned supreme in the United States because there was that huge influence of Fokin, Nijinska, um, um, Margaret Krask, of course. So, and, and that was that was a big uh, part of it. But Kara was talking about to recognize a dancer from the coordination of the arm. And it made me, every time I teach, not to have a dancer, when you do a développé, to start with your arm fifth en bas, and go retirer and développé, and not start with your arm there mm -hmm. when you do the retiré. And it's so difficult, but this is coordination. And then you see it when uh, you dance. Um, I wanted to say something about uh, Twyla because I, I've known Twyla since the 60s. Mm -hmm. So we, we were in class together and she would send her group that she had at the time to Richard Thomas to take classes. And Richard Thomas was trained by Celli and by Nijinska. So, and, and then also the Merce Cunningham Company en masse and Paul Taylor would come and take classes with Richard Thomas. So there was always that connection. It's, it's, I think what Pam was saying about what is contemporary ballet. Yeah, I, I always wondered what it was too. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 
it's so funny as everyone is sharing all these wonderful anecdotes it emphasizes just how small the dance world has always been we think about the 21st century the rise of globalization culturally with as all of our technological abilities have increased including technology like zoom that allows us to be all over the world and to make connections with each other more easily but it really seems that for much of ballet's history, you know, I'm sure to some extent because of how much companies would tour globally, it really feels that there was a certain amount of sharing and intermixing and, oh, of course, this huge ballet figure knew this one and that one and this one, and then you know, from one generation to the next, um, that there are always those strong ties, which, is really a beautiful thing about the ballet community that I don't feel we discuss all that often. Raymond, I'm going to give you an example of contemporary ballet. <laughs> Here you go. <laughs> I think that what has happened <clears throat> is let's make let's make it ugly and as i think you're absolutely right when you say they're doing it and it has no purpose there's no thought behind the process what am i really doing in ballet we have whether it's a neoclassic without a story or the story of Giselle or Swan Lake. There is that link between the music, the movement that gives it emotion and feeling. And we still only have two arms, two legs, one head, two eyes. We haven't grown a tail. We lost it. You can only move so many ways. You can either move into beauty or out of it. And it seems to me there's a lot of emphasis also on trying to make the female dancer look tough. Ooh. Okay, I'm going to get my tattoos. I'm going to get my letter. I'm going to get, and I, I'm going to be a tough girl, tough. Instead of just simply working with the body, working with the music, working with the story, taking on what's out here in nature and in the world. So I, I just have to really question people when they say, well, I don't teach ballet. I teach contemporary ballet. Mm -hmm. I don't know, what do you teach, Raymond, Franco? <laughs> we're, we're old fashioned, we're old people, so we teach just plain ballet. <laughs> See, to me, well, look, I'm the same age as you, Frank, uh, Raymond. <laughs> I teach ballet. I don't care what you call it. And when I'm doing a degage a la seconde, completely over to the side, I can stretch my arms and call it a tilt. It's all the same. Mm -hmm. Movement is movement. It all goes back to ancient times, actually. When Raymond is actually a better historian than I am. But <clears throat> you can link it right to yoga. 
How many ways can the body move? I said too much, sorry. It's your talk, not mine. <laughs> well, you know me, you both know me. So um, it, it's really funny because we had a, a, a talk uh, with Kevin uh, the other day on Zoom and it was uh, for a bunch of people. And he said that at a certain moment, he was very hesitant to create a school because often a school attached to companies tend to exaggerate perhaps the style of that company and they almost become a caricature of the company. And so he was so concerned about that that he didn't want the um, an ABT school that would be, then may become a caricature of what the company was performing. And but that when we created the curriculum, which, which he knew very well that we had a strong basis in the Chiquetti, that all our dancers were extremely versatile and they did not become, they were stylistically neutral, but be sensitive enough to be able to move from one style to another, which is so required in, in the repertoire, mm -hmm. basically all mm -hmm. companies. Okay. And if you think of it, Diaghilev was perhaps the first company where dancers had to move from one place to another stylistically, mm -hmm. from Les Ilfie to the Rite of Spring of Nijinsky, as you were saying, and who was their teacher? It was Chiquetti, their teacher. And uh, so it g he gave them that basis to be able to move in all those directions, which is basically what most ballet companies do now in the world. But uh, Diana, when we took a soirée musicale in Russia, it was incredible to see dancer from the Bolshoi company to came and spoke with me about, first of all, uh, because uh, it was a very, for, because we know Tudor more dramatic. Mm. Soiree musicale is so fun. That's why it's very good for a young dancer. Yeah. But everybody was interested in the Tudor work and Tudor and Chiquette are very close. It was something, I think it was uh, one of my best shows <laughs> to take oh, <laughs> Soiree Musicale. Yeah, the, the Russians loved it. and they Because did. we did Soiree Musicale and uh, um, World, Fantasy. The World Fantasy. Then something, in a way, Tudor, I consider Tudor more American than English because he, yeah. he, did, he, did, he did for a bit what uh, Alexei is doing now. Yeah. But everybody was so interesting in Soiree Musicale. It was fantastic. Yeah, he, Soiree Musicale was, he originally choreographed it on students for a Giacchetti Gala. Mm -hmm. It was done for the Giacchetti, for the Giacchetti uh, Congress in, La in London. Yeah. And I know that one of the people who was in it was Peggy Van Prague. Yep. Peggy was in it. And, and of course we have a connection with Peggy because she examined Franco's <laughs> fellowship. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great it's really wonderful that they loved it there but I think uh, when you came and you said it for us uh, you did it twice with two different groups uh, but all the dancer was so happy to do it oh that's that's really nice to hear because I always feel that they a little bit gets their nose out of joint because you can't you can't show versatility with a lot of pirouettes or a great big jump. It's really dancing. It's just dancing. So I always worry that, you know, it might be a little battle because their nose will be out of joint that they can't do the kind of things that they love to do. But it was a great pleasure and honor to work with the students because um, everybody really did it. You know, there wasn't a fight. They were just so happy to do it. I think everybody was used to because uh, I think I never in my class push to have your legs more higher and to do more and more and more. But because uh, we were so lucky, our mentor was from the Paris Opera and what he told us all the time in the company, quality first. When you can put quality and quantity together, welcome. But first, quality. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, it was it was a wonderful experience. Tudor did another ballet that was not dramatic called um, 
Trio Combrio. That's um, he did it at Jacob's Pillow. I don't know if anybody's familiar with it. I should show it's very, um, it was his take on Balanchine. And it's for, it's to Glinka and it's uh, one woman and two men where Balanchine's Glinka was two women and one man. I've always would love to see them side by side. We also did a duet, that beautiful duet that he did for um, the uh, Juilliard. At uh, Juilliard. I forgot the name. Uh, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the little improvisations. Little improvisations. Yes, exactly. That's gorgeous, gorgeous. Charming. Yes. Yeah, he did that at Jacob's Pillow as well. He created it at Jacob's we, Pillow. We did for the, one of the JKO performance one year. Yeah, isn't it? It's so charming. Yeah. It just always puts a smile on my face when I see it. I think I saw the Royal Ballet School do it in one of their performances. I don't know if you were there, Cara, if you went to the Royal Opera House. One year, the Royal Ballet School presented little improvisations. The children at the, at the uh, when they were at the graduation show. We did it in studio company, um, actually, my first year in studio company. Mm -hmm. yeah. But honey, Camille, yeah, we that. did the change with the Royal Ballet, and we did again a soirée musicale. Monica loved it. She loved it. She yeah. came and she was so happy. So, Cindy, what are you doing now? Tell us a little bit what you're doing now, and Remy, tell us. Um, for me, I'm currently a soloist dancer at Ballet Theatre of Maryland, which is a smaller company in Annapolis, Maryland, but I've had the opportunity to do some fun roles since being here. Um, Lucy in Dracula, Myrta in Giselle very recently, and of course your Dewdrop Fairies in Arabian. A lot of... Uh, tall girl, big jumping, because uh, that's a little bit of my specialty, but working on a degree in business communication because I'd like to stay in the dance world, both um, on the teaching side, as well as the perhaps marketing side of things, and just to give back to the um, art form once I've had the opportunity to finish out my career. So keeping pretty busy. And Remy? Absolutely. Um, well, so currently we are about to start a rehearsal period for our touring season. Uh, this year we'll be going to back to California. We were just there for Nutcracker. Uh, we go there every year, multiple times a year, sometimes Orange County. We'll also be going to Virginia Beach, New Orleans, DC, which we normally go to every year, uh, and then straight to our Met season. Uh, there is a slated tour to Taipei in July. I'm not sure if I was supposed to tell any of anyone that, but, um, between us, yeah, Taipei supposedly, um, but lots of Don Q this season. That's mostly what we're doing on tour. Um, so I'll be working on the flower girl. Some, some call it bridesmaids, the jumping one, lots of Grand Allegro. So my Shikari training will come in handy for that. Uh, but I'm really looking forward to that. And then we're doing, we have a lovely Met season this year. I'm very pleased. Um, it's all the classics. It's uh, Don Q, Swan Lake, Ritmonsky's newest ballet, um, Of Love and Rage, which we didn't get to perform at the Met because 2020. Um, theme and Variations, one of my favorites. Uh, we will be doing uh, Swan Lake, R&J, all of the classics. So I'm really, really looking forward to this season. Um, but... Yeah, no, I, I also am pursuing a degree at Fordham University, a political science and English double major, but ABT, this semester I'll be doing something through ABT. They have a wonderful uh, crossover into business program with Harvard. Um, our CEO started this a couple of years ago. So there have been a few classes of dancers to participate in that. So I'm going up to Cambridge next weekend to kick that off. Um, so yeah, it's gonna be a, a busy, season upcoming, but I'm, I'm really looking forward to it, all good things. So just focus on staying healthy. Definitely. Yeah. Well, this has been an absolute joy to hear you, Cindy and Remy, uh, talking so, addressing everything so articulately and with such true passion. So it does give us hope for the, for the future. Looking back 
but being in the present and and looking ahead. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being with us. And everyone else as well, thank you for the input from Franco and Raymond and Pam and Kara and Diana and yeah. Thank you. I would much. just like to say, young ladies, as obviously I'm only 19. I don't know how old Raymond really is. Yes, I do. He's the same age, so he's only 19 too. You're 19, Raymond. <laughs> I am forever 19, but I'm 73. <laughs> I'm going to be 74 this year. Well, mine is in April, okay? <laughs> Isn't yours April also? June. June. Oh, you're Gemini. <laughs> okay, at any rate, Cindy, Remy, Remy, I'm expecting to hear that you have received your diploma. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> Cindy? Mm -hmm. You guys are the future and all of the others that we've worked with over these many years. Because I'll tell you as much as I would like to live forever, it ain't going to happen. I wanted to so, say thank you to, to Remy and Cindy. Um, Remy, I'm sure you're a beautiful dancer. I don't know you as I know Cindy. <laughs> but wanted just to say too, as um, one of her examiners, that she danced such a beautiful diploma exam, um, not only artistically and, and counted strength wise, but she really took it from an intellectual point of really knowing the work and knowing the impetus and how to achieve steps. And uh, just, she was beautiful to examine and it was a pleasure. Thank you both. Oh, thank you so much. I was looking at my, uh, diploma diploma booklet last night and just remembering the experience. It was really wonderful getting to do it with you and with Leslie. Thank you. Good. Well, I'm looking forward to your futures. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. Thank you for doing this. Thank you, you all. all. Us. Very much. And um, stand by for our next Zoom talk and what we'll be covering. Excellent. Hi, everyone.